And I said, on one condition. And he said, what's that? I said, that you guys would sell our Kaleo CDs. And he said, deal, it's done. So I have, we have in the bookstore, it's called Dynamus Worship. It's called Simply Christmas, an acoustic album from the Canyon City worship team. And so if you want any of these, I haven't heard it yet, so, uh, but I just love these guys and love what they're doing, so that's why we're endorsing it. And you can buy them in the bookstore right now. But I have two I want to give away. Who would like a free CD from... Come on up. Phyllis, you pray all the time for us, so you deserve a CD. Anyone over here? No, I don't want to give it to you. Come on, Randall. Randall, you have a heart for kids. I love your heart, and you're a Bronco fan. So God bless you. Even though his wife is a Kansas City fan. Ooh. So anyway, we also want you guys to know that uh, we, we, we're trying to plan for Christmas morning. Now, obviously, our, our big services are going to be Christmas Eve and at 4 and 6. And I want to encourage you guys, if you're coming, to come early. Otherwise, you may end up parking in the Canyon View Park and watching the service on Ustream. So if, if you um, are planning on coming Christmas morning, though, we're planning on having it in the chapel Again, this is no pressure. I have no expectations. It's just if you and your family would like to come to that service on Christmas morning at 11, could you please raise your hand? Because we, we need a count for how we need to plan for to make sure we're going to have enough room. Hold, hold your hands up, please. And so I'm getting a scientific uh, count here. Okay, thank you very much. God bless you. So that is the 25th, right? And so what I'm going to talk about today, though, is there is a controversy on when Jesus' birthday actually is. Is it really December 25th, or is it another day? And maybe the third question is, does it really matter? And, and that's what I'll get to. And this Christmas controversy is something that is really kind of becoming a movement in the evangelical church. And some of you may not know that, but... but uh, there are actually people that promote not celebrating Christmas at the, in December. And so in, in our culture, it seems like anything that has Jesus attached to it creates a controversial stir, right? Just, just look at Tim Tebow and him Tebowing. Why is he so controversial besides him being a bad quarterback that wins? It, it's really because of his beliefs that he wears on his sleeve. So, if you remember a few years ago, Target, Walmart actually told their employees, you are not allowed to say Merry Christmas out of fear of offending somebody who is not of the Christian faith. And you know, Christians across the nation said, well, if you do that, we're not going to shop from your stores. And so they changed their stance and say, okay, you can say Merry Christmas. We have... Uh, various secular uh, movements that are against having a nativity scene on anything that is of public uh, land or property. And in Canyon City, I remember uh, when our, our boys were in grade school, they had a great music teacher. Her name was Dina Brady. And uh, the Christmas show, we would go to it, and the first time we went to uh, Wade's Christmas show, where they were singing and stuff, they, it was all about Jesus doing Christmas carols and, and celebrating the birth of Jesus. And I went up to Dina, Dina after and I go, man, how do you get away with that in today's climate? She goes, the principal told me, as long as no one files a formal complaint, go for it. Isn't that great? And, and no one ever did complain. But there is roots to this controversy that really stems from a lot of what we've been talking about the last couple weeks. A DJ two weeks ago talked about where Christmas trees come from and Christmas lights and how the roots of that are in the Yule celebration where they're celebrating the coming of spring. And last week I talked about the, the issue of Santa Claus. And is Santa Claus truly a mythical figure? Obviously. But the roots of Santa Claus come from St. Nicholas. And so you look at other things that we tend to... Uh, 
kind of have as a custom at Christmas, the mistletoe, the caroling, uh, holly wreaths. Um, all of these have actual pre-Christmas roots in them, and many of them are used in, in actual pagan rituals. That, and it's interesting that there was actually a, a Christian mandate in England in the 1600s that forbid people to celebrate Christmas. Now, at this time, the English Parliament was really uh, influenced heavily by the Puritan church. And so during the English interregnum, that's what it's called, when the Puritans basically controlled the Parliament, they made a mandate that they banned Christmas celebration entirely. And here's what they said. They were placing it with the day of fasting, considering it a popish festival with no biblical justification in a time of wasteful and immoral behavior. And some of you have just come in off the end of a party celebrating Christmas at your office, and you're probably saying, yep, that's pretty much what it was. <laughs> they even sent their army out to go into homes and if they were cooking any meat, they would confiscate it. What this actually did was it caused so much resent, resentment in the people. It caused a riot in Kent. And it also led, these were some of the roots that led to the Second Civil War in England. Now, this, this Puritan roots, though, is, is very deeply embedded in a, a strong movement in the church that says that we shouldn't celebrate any of the normal trappings of Christmas because of its pagan roots. And they go to scripture like Isaiah 2.6. It says, you, Lord, have abandoned your people, the descendants of Jacob. Why would God abandon his people? It says, they are full of superstitions from the east. They practice divination like the Philistines and embrace pagan customs. So they, they take something like this and say, see, if if we allow Christmas in our church, God's hand is going to be removed. His blessing is going to be removed from us. In Lamentations 1.10 says, The enemy laid hands on all her treasures. This is talking about Jerusalem. And she saw pagan nations enter her sanctuary, which is the temple, those you had forbidden to enter your assembly. And they're saying, when we allow these pagan practices to kind of seep into what we see as normal kind of uh, Christianity and practices, what happens is we become sort of tarnished, that, that we water down our faith by allowing these practices to come in. So, but where does December 25th come from? And there, there's a lot of influence in this, and DJ talked two weeks ago about the influence of the celebration of the winter solstice, which we know today as being December 21st of the actual day that uh, the, the calendar begins to change where the days become longer and the nights become shorter, right? But traditionally, they, they viewed that as December 25th, and many of these pagan holidays follow that. So anyone in here, are you Scandinavian or German? Raise your hand. Okay, I shouldn't raise my hand because <laughs> I'm not Scandinavian or German in case you haven't noticed. I'm actually from far eastern France is where <laughs> my roots come from. But the, the Scandinavian and the Germans, they, they had this 12-day celebration that began on December 25th and it was called the Yule. The Yule celebration is where we get the Yule log from in, in Rome. They worship Sol Invictus, and Sol Invictus is the unconquerable sun. So they worship the sun god. And uh, Emperor Aurelian, he made December 25th the day that they, they worship Sol Invictus. Now, in 274 AD, when the solstice came, the Roman emperor at this time was Aurelian, and he proclaimed December 25th as Natalis Solis Invicti, the festival of the birth of the invincible sun. And so Saturn being uh, viewed as a god of the sun, they 
uh, put out Saturnalia holly, which is holly they'd put out in, uh, in, in worship of the Saturn sun god. And so that's where uh, we see the roots of holly on Christmas because it said that at this time there were many Christians, followers of Jesus in Rome, Rome but to avoid being persecuted and being singled out of not worshiping the sun god, they would put up holly around their house. And as, uh, as the tradition began to uh, become deeply embedded in the culture, then it began to be transferred over to Christmas. Now, in 125 through 136 AD, the bishop of Rome was Telesphorus, and he designated that the, the church services in December should focus around the nativity of our Lord and Savior. So he began to uh, influence the church, uh, uh, which at this time was a Roman Catholic church, that December was set aside to focus on the coming of Jesus Christ, of the nativity. And, uh, but still, no one was really quite sure when the actual birth of Jesus really was. And a lot of this is because of traditionally in, in uh, Jewish culture, uh, because they follow the lunar calendar and not the calendar uh, we follow, that um, the days change during the year and they don't really know exactly the date of their birthday. And so uh, it was very traditional at this time that, that the people of Jewish origin that followed Christ would celebrate Jesus in the fall. And this really fell in line with when the Jews would ha go to Jerusalem in the fall and have their festivals like Rosh Hashanah that they would celebrate. And, and then in 320 AD, Pope Julius I specified December 25th as the official date of the birth of Jesus. And then five years later, in 325 AD, Constantine designated December 25th, he called it an immovable date to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And so culturally, that's how we kind of settled in on the 25th of December. But there was still a lot of pagan influence in what people did during this period, but it still wasn't something that was deeply embedded in the culture, that the December 25th would come and go and just be like any other day. They say that when Charles Dickens, in 1834, wrote his book, A Christmas Carol, um, this began a movement in the American culture where Christmas started to become like a holiday. In the book, we all know, it, and by the way, my favorite version of A Christmas Carol is the Mr. Magoo Christmas Carol. Uh, I, I just love that. I still, as a kid, remember watching Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol, and I don't think you can even get it anymore. Some of you younger are going, who's Mr. Magoo? <laughs> I had a professor in, college, in seminary, Vernon Grounds. I used to chuckle whenever I saw him because he looked just like Mr. Magoo. <laughs> but anyway... In, in the Christmas Carol, we, most of us, I'm sure we know the story, where Scrooge, right, is bah humbug on Christmas, and he gets visited by three um, angels the, of uh, the past, and the, the present, and the future, and uh, he was a very shrewd businessman, and he, a guy that worked for him was uh, Mr. Cratchit. Mr. Cratchit had his young son, Tiny Tim, that was... Uh, was handicapped and, and was going to die, and Scrooge turns around and, and realizes that he had been missing everything in his life and started celebrating the wonder of Christmas. And so in, in this book, he even talked about that Congress met on December 25th, and then after this book was written in 1870, the U.S. Congress actually designated December 25th as a national holiday. And so that's why you guys get December 25th off, unless, of course, you're in law enforcement or something like that, or a pastor. <laughs> so why is there a, a strong belief in October being the actual birth of Jesus, though? Now, 
many people believe that it's really strongly uh, rooted in the, the Messianic movement. And what the Messianic movement is really uh, people that are of Jewish tradition uh, have come to realize that Jesus, that they call Yeshua, actually is the Messiah, the Savior of the world that they have been praying for. Now, there, there's many influences here of why they see the fall being the actual birth date of Jesus. In Luke 2, let me, let me read this from verses 1 through 6, as they talk about the account of the birth of Jesus. Um, it says, In those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. So, so kind of keep that in your mind of the census being taken. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Now, it's interesting when you read Luke, just as a parenthetical note. Luke was a physician, a man of detail, and he was known to be a great historian. And so where he talks about Caesar Augustus and Quirinius, these are actually historical people. This is a historical account. It's not some story that man made up so that we would follow some kind of false god. Okay? So it says, And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. And again, the reason the scripture says goes up, because Galilee is actually north of Jerusalem. The reason they say he went up is because it's in elevation. That from Galilee, you go up a couple of thousand feet to get to Jerusalem, which is on Mount Zion. Just to help you understand the language here. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child, Jesus. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So what, by Jewish tradition, what they believe is that, um, that the census that was taken was taken actually in the fall. There's a couple of reasons. Uh, in the King James... It says uh, taxes, not a census. In the NIV, it, takes a, it says census, where they count how many people are in the kingdom, right? And it's believed that actually both probably occurred at that time. And uh, during the fall, during September, is when people would go on a pilgrimage from all around the Roman world to Jerusalem to do the festivals that the scriptures mandated them to practice, like Rosh Hashanah. And so it was, very, it was very understandable that at this time, they said, well, since the Jews are going to be going to Jerusalem anyway, let's take the census then. The other thing was that the taxes really were uh, imposed upon the people after they made their money through farming. It was an agrarian culture at this time. And so they really didn't have anything to give to Rome until they got the harvest from their crops, sold their crops, and then were able to pay Rome what was due to Rome. And so they really do see this as being in the fall because they also said that uh, traditionally from November, the end of November through the beginning of March is the rainy season in Palestine. And so it would, been, it would have been very difficult during the rainy season for the people at this time to travel because they're not traveling in cars or trains, but they're going by foot or on a donkey, right? So with all of those factors involved in that, that's why the, the Messianic movement really believes that Jesus was actually born in October. Now, they also add to this the, uh, the account that happened in Luke 4. And in Luke 4, starting on verse 16, what we see here is Jesus is now back in his hometown in Nazareth. And he goes into the synagogue, and it was a practice when you go into the synagogue that when it's the uh, kind of the anniversary of your bar mitzvah, which is when a, when a young man is 13 years old, he's bar mitzvah. This is where they celebrate him reaching manhood. And he has to do all these religious practices of, of the Jewish faith. 
And so whenever he would go to the synagogue on a, kind of the anniversary of the time of when he was bar mitzvah, which is usually on his birthday, then they would have him read from the scriptures. So this is what was happening right here. In uh, Luke 4, Jesus goes into the synagogue. He, he, they, he's given the scroll from the book of Isaiah, and this is what he reads. On verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue was fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, the significance of that is in the Jewish calendar, which is this time around October, it was the common practice that they would read through the book of Isaiah in synagogue. And so Jesus just didn't walk in and say, hmm, I think I'll read from Isaiah. He was given the book of Isaiah. He was to read the scriptures, and this is at that time the scriptures that they were at. It's also by Jewish tradition, the belief is, is when you go and you read the scriptures in the synagogue at this time, it's sort of a prophecy of what God is going to do in your, in your life. So it wasn't like too outlandish for Jesus to say, Today, today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing because it was believed that it was a prophetic word, but Jesus is trying to help them understand. Guys, I'm the Messiah. I'm who you've been praying for, but they didn't get it. And so that is why there is such a strong movement of people that have kind of latched on to this, this reasoning of why they believe that Jesus was actually born sometime in October. Now, it's really interesting. I watched a, a DVD series. Uh, it's a talk uh, called the, the Star of Bethlehem. It's really fascinating how this guy's a lawyer, and he starts doing some research of astronomy, and he, uh, through the mathematical formulas that were created by uh, these brilliant men in the past, and by uh, a computer software, they were able to really show that uh, uh, Jupiter aligns with uh, Venus on December 25th of this particular year, and it appears in the sky as the brightest star they had ever seen. And, and there's much more to it that it was all over my head. But th there is scientific evidence that he is saying that December 25th is the actual time that the Magi actually did go and see Jesus in Bethlehem. So, with all of this that I'm mentioning, is how should we respond? Because, you know, some people are thinking, you know, geez, maybe we shouldn't go to church on Saturday night. It's Christmas Eve. And others are saying, you know, I don't really care. And I think the reality is, Regardless of whether Jesus was born in the fall or in December, it really doesn't matter. What really matters is that we seek Jesus, is, is that we pursue him because that's what he's just calling us to do. And you, I love this account from Luke 2. And I, what I want us to imagine is that we are back in the time of the birth of Christ over 2,000 years ago. And we're shepherds, we're sheep herders, and, and we have our flock of sheep in this little valley, this fertile valley between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. They're about four miles apart. And we're out there, and the only light that we have seen is the reflection of the sun and the moon, of seeing the twinkle of the stars, and probably one candlelight of power, of, of light. Is, is all that we have ever seen. And so we've never seen spotlights like this. We've never seen cities lit up with lights. This is a foreign thing and not even imaginable to a person's experience. 
And so, with that in mind, look at verse 8 of Luke 2. And it says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flock at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. I, I think that is putting it mildly. And they just fell on their face when they saw this. they never seen or experienced anything like this before. You would have done the same thing. And so when this happens, what we need to understand is that they were just out in the field protecting their flocks. They were doing what they did every day. That they were protecting their flocks from being eaten by wolves and by bears and lions and things, right? And I think the reality is, is when you are going on with your daily routine, you're doing what you do every day, the kingdom sometimes comes crashing in. This is what happened to these guys. And this is what I'm praying for all of you guys, that this Christmas, when you least expect it, Jesus will come crashing into your world and change you forever. That really is my prayer. And it says, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. He, it's pretty obvious. They're going, hee, 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 hee. They're, they're shaking in their boots. And he says, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. That's where the gospel comes from. Good news is the gospel. And he says, today in the town of David, which is Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. The angels tell him, guys, dudes, you don't need to be afraid. Have good cheer because the Savior, the Messiah that you have been praying for is here. He's right over there, guys, in the town of Bethlehem. You can go find him. Now, I just think about this as what is good news, really? It, good news really isn't good news unless we know the opposite. You know what I mean? Like, like if you go to the doctor and you know you have a condition, and you know that if the diagnosis is what the doctors find out, you know that you're in trouble. And you go and get some tests. The doctor calls you into his office and he says, I don't have any explanation to this, but your disease isn't there anymore. What is that? That's absolutely good news, isn't it? Or if you go to court, because you haven't been listening to Pastor Kirk and your foot's a little too heavy, right? And you are caught speeding in a school zone. And you go to court, and the judge says, I'm sorry, but there was a mistake on your records here. Uh, we can't prosecute you. You're, you're free to go. Man, that is good news, baby, right? <laughs> so we really can't comprehend and understand the message that the angel is saying here, bringing good news to them, that, that a Savior has come until we understand what the implications are for our lives if we don't have a Savior. As we went through the book of Romans over the last year or so. Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This is a universal truth for every man and woman in this room is that we have not lived our life where God is the focus and the center of our life every minute of every day. None of us have, have we? Raise your hand if you have, because we want to sit down and worship you. Yeah, none of us have. And so Romans 6, 23 says, and the penalty of sin is death, meaning eternal separation from God. And you know what? All the religion in the world can't save you. You can't be good enough. You can't make yourself gooder in God's eyes because of sin. It's, it's a spiritual condition that we have been born into. And so that's why in Romans 8, 
it says in verse 1, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. That, my friends, is the good news. That's what Jesus came for. 